founding fathers of New York rock and roll passed away. I spent a couple of days with them last fall, and this is his story. Murray the K. The golden age of rock and roll. Uh, those old sounds bring back the memories, don't they? Well, do you recognize this sound? Hi, I'm Murray the K. I had an idea of wanting to do things that completely different in presenting rock music on the air and in communicating with my audience. And communicate he did. In the 1950s, when rock and roll was born, Murray Kaufman was there. He practically delivered the musical baby. He became a generation's guru of the airwaves and New York's number one rock DJ and concert promoter. Nobody understood those kids like Murray the K. Right now, I got a TCB. Take care of business, baby. All right. The phrase at that time was the generation gap, right? So I, I would relate to them with their lifestyle at home and their relationship with their parents and with their girlfriend or at their school or at their job. And so that they knew that this show belonged to them as much as it belonged to me. And they, what they did is they had teenage music by teenagers for teenagers. And rock and roll was born. And they stopped dancing the way their parents did. And it was a complete dichotomy that happened. And the more people objected to it, the more they loved it because that set them apart. I think it's real hot, rock and roll. Well, bebop doesn't make you go as much as, as rock and roll does. Go, man, go, man, go, man, go, go, go. Do you think there's anything special about rock and roll? Yes, sir. It's here to stay. Definitely. It'll never go away as far as I'm concerned. Just go, man, go. Uh -huh. Their parents didn't want them listening to that kind of music. They felt that it was suggestive, it brought on sexual promiscuity, but it was a start of recognizing that they're their own people and they have their own values and they have their own art and form, and it started to happen. Okay. To the teenagers, the K was radio's Pied Piper. To their parents, he was a cultural villain. And the kids followed him to the Brooklyn Fox Theater for Murray's series of classic rock concerts, one great group after another. The Temptations. The Righteous Brothers. Dionne Warwick. And little Anthony. Then, in 1964, something happened that shook American rock and roll right down to the ground. It also rocketed Murray the K to international fame. It had something to do with the arrival of a group called the Beatles. When the Beatles came to New York, they met Murray and almost instantly adopted him as the fifth Beatle. I took their invitation and like Tom Wolfe wrote in the book, he says Murray they came and walked into the Plaza Hotel and he never came out. I'm going to do a little free association here. I'm just going to throw out the names of the Beatles and you just tell me off the top of your head what your impressions were. If I said Ringo to you, what would you say? Clown. He always seemed like he never wanted to go home, you know. He was always like... You, you know, lonely boy. George. George asked you a question. You give him an answer. You can't give him some vague answer. You've got to be very specific with George. It's got to be right on the line, and very plain. Paul, uh, very introspective. Absolute perfectionist, especially when it comes to music. John Lennon. Straight out there. 
And it was a great feeling to have. You know, you know where you stood with John Lennon. Was there ever a moment when you realized that the Beatles were going to be the biggest thing ever to hit rock and roll? Oh, yeah. That was when they broke through the crowds, broke through the cordon at Union Station in Washington, D.C., and I can see it in headlines. Murray Kay crushed by crowd with Liverpool group. And I remember George Harrison turning to me and saying, isn't it fun? <laughs> but times changed. Rock radio phased out the personality DJ. Murray moved from New York to the West Coast, and the rock scene lost some of its greatest music makers. When Hendrix and Joplin and Jim Morrison and Brian Epstein died, all of a sudden you begin to realize that part of your life, I mean, th those people aren't there anymore, and you begin to miss them. Probably the forerunner to the whole punk scene was Jim Morrison of The Doors. He's so popular now, even after his death. You knew him in the early days. He was a very complex young man, but at the same time very gentle, and one who would listen and want to learn, but he had it. I mean, he really sort of mesmerized an audience. Strange, all right, yeah, people are strange. When you're a stranger, faces and complaints. something his own doing that stopped him from moving on to where he should have moved. I mean, he turned to alcohol and it, it finally killed him. Dearest of all to Murray was John Lennon. The two remained close friends after the Beatles' breakup. They often exchanged personal thoughts and observations, as in this exclusive interview. It always struck me that I was writing the most amazing opposite songs of... Uh, that I should have been. When I was with Maharishi, I wrote Year Blues, which was uh, really my own blues, you know, which was like, I really felt bad. I wrote I'm So Tired, which is another miserable song that was on the Beatles' White Album. The real disenchantment was, I mean, there ain't nobody can tell anybody anything. You have to experience it yourself. There ain't no gurus. I just don't believe in them anymore. He left us a sense of truth. Now, I would never give money to a violent cause, and I never have. Because although I believe in, ultimately, in self-defense, I believe more in peace and non-violence than anything else. I've never given money to people who, who would use it violently. We had a lot of John Lennon. We didn't have enough. To give the public more of John Lennon, Murray was working as senior consultant on a film about the ex-Beatle. He had also gone through some problems of his own, bankruptcy and serious illness. What I have is, uh, and I think we might as well get out in the opening because I can hear people say, does he have cancer right. or what? I have what is, I guess, is a form of cancer. It's called follicular lymphoma. It was really a little touch and go there for a while, but the good Lord was uh, decided that I should be around for a little while. So I have a complete recovery. I'm back in the saddle again, ready to do my thing. And I, I just love this town I love the people in it and I love the fact that they that they remembered me four months after this interview Murray Kaufman died of the cancer he thought he had beaten 